what you describe, Brian, reminds me a little bit about the recommendation that really drives a lot of why behavioral threat assessment and dedicated teams and a dedicated centralized process exists. And I, I know that this language is used in our in reports from the Secret Service and um, and others around eliminating silos of information. And I think when you give this sense of we're going to have a, a bit case or conduct case, you're creating those false silos of information and these siloed processes that have no means in which to intersect and for a dedicated process or group to consider the bigger picture. And so I really like us thinking about conduct or discipline as a parallel process to the bit. It's running alongside it. It's coordinated. And there's there's good communication and information flowing be between the two, but they are parallel and separate processes that exist together. Two approaches here, and I think Brian used this a lot, but the Goldilocks would say one of these is way too hot and one of these is way too cold of an approach. And maybe the too hot one is this idea where institutions, and you've talked a lot about this recently, they utilize zero tolerance policies or organizations build zero tolerance policies, or they move toward like immediate removal and suspension. So that's the too hot where it really limits our opportunity to gather more information and gain some buy-in and support around what's happening. And then you have the too cold side, which is maybe it's, maybe that should be the too hot one, but the too cold approach where it's like, well, we're going to forego the conduct process because this individual has so much going on and this is the last thing they need, right? Or there's just, this is, we're not going to use the conduct process because there's just so much going on with the individual. And really, right, don't we want a little bit more of that in the middle approach, that progressive conduct or discipline approach where we're early on, as you said, with low level violations, helping individuals to see, uh, I think you used this back in the day, to see the roadsides that they're about to drive off the cliff, right? Or also to just help them drive better <laughs> as well. So I don't, I don't know if you guys have a thought on that. Brian, I know you've talked a lot about zero tolerance policies, but sort of we see this, right? Too hot, too cold approach in terms of discipline and conduct. I love that description. And I think the Goldilocks too hot, too cold is like spot on the you know, part of conduct's job, right? As they, as a student's, you know, driving their car towards the cliff of expulsion, our job is to put up road signs along the way. As the counselor here kind of nerding out on due process, because it came to me later in life, it wasn't my initial training area, but as I cross-trained, which also we'll put a pin in, because I think that's super important, the idea of learning about due process and, you know, what I see sometimes from faculty, bless their hearts, pull on my Kentucky a little bit here. Uh, they, they send like a bulleted list and like, here's why this student is done. And anytime I get a bulleted list from faculty, I, I read that as the student has had no due process. They've, and, and I think it comes from a good place for faculty. I don't think faculty are all bad in this space. I think they say, we're going to help back to your point, Amy, where we can. The student has so much going on, but they get to this Popeye moment, dating myself here, but I can't stand no more, right? And he, he, he kind of loses it. So that's where faculty, I think, get at the end. They're like, this student can't be in the program anymore. Let me create this list of all the things I've tried with them, none of which have worked. And this should be the justification the problem is this isn't how our legal system works or how student conduct works in a shadow or an echo of our legal system. There's due process. And simply stated, when we take a student who might have a mental illness, who might be coming back from active combat or a veteran, or someone might have a physical disability, and we give them, uh, like I said, the get, get out of jail free card, we give them this opportunity to skip the conduct process. It, I really think it's useful to see that as stealing due process from that student. I couldn't agree more. And I think some of you may be familiar with uh, the work of Gary Pavella. He was really not solely introducing, but certainly got that thought out there that, yeah, we should not skip over that um, necessarily. We, we can time it in ways. And I think those are great conversations to have at the bit table. That makes sense. And we may not want to do it the same day. Somebody has a major meeting with their psychiatrist to figure out their meds. If people at the table can share that, they may not be able to, but get some hints from our colleagues that, yeah, Thursday, probably not a good day to schedule that hearing. Okay, great. We'll shoot for Friday or Monday, you know? So I think there's some, some ways to work with that in the conduct process. But it also, time and time again, I've seen situations where, and, and I'll, I'll own early on, I was probably part of some of those situations where you you defer to the side of saying, oh, hey, no, we're, we're caring people. We're not going to we're not going to bring out the hammers right now. Again, you write about due process, Brian, but also you may be putting others at the institution in, in jeopardy in some ways, if not the institution from a liability standpoint, 
because you reach a point where you're like, well, we haven't really done anything from a conduct standpoint yet, but everybody's feeling like this person needs to not be here anymore. What are we even doing? So, and again, that's not my goal by any means is to remove anybody, but it, it, it's okay to use that in mental health cases as well. But again, it has to be after a well thought out conversation with many heads at the table and, and thinking through that. Um, when we talk about this hesitancy to use the conduct process that we probably haven't done a good job talking about what Brian mentioned, the roots of the conduct process, the overall philosophy around conduct. And certainly this differs from organization to institution in a higher ed institution or an educational institution. You know, we know that the roots are really in this being an educational and developmental process versus it, versus it being a punitive one. And so, but those conversations, your organizational philosophy around conduct, that should be something that the BIT team or the team that whoever, the threat assessment team understands, or is at least having some conversations about so that that's not, that that's a piece of that crossover training. I think, Brian, that you were, you were mentioning that the, the team has some sense of sort of the overall philosophy and process that's related to conduct. 